one. This, uh, this talk is, is uh, not a very code-heavy talk, but uh, there are a bunch of command lines that you might like to copy and paste uh, if you want to try things out. Um, so if you want to scan the QR code, uh, go to the URL. There's a copy of the slides uh, right there, uh, so you can follow along at your own pace. Um, my name is Taylor Campbell. Uh, as you can see in this very, this very small text that we had to write on this badge because the, the <laughs> printers uh, seem to have missed it. Um, or I also go by uh, Riestra in NetBSD. Um, I'm on the uh, core team of NetBSD. I've been hacking NetBSD for, uh, well, I've been using it for about 15 years. Uh, and I started hacking it fairly early on. Uh, I've been a NetBSD developer for about, um, what is it, 12 years at this point. Um, I, uh, I work on various things in NetBSD. Um, uh, and um, uh, anywhere from networking to file systems to concurrency to uh, uh, drawing pretty pictures on the screen, which I'm not very good at. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so I got started hacking NetBSD um, uh, fairly early on in, in using it. And I'll go into the uh, origin story a bit in a moment. Um, but first, this is the main thing that you need in order to start hacking NetBSD. Um, you just need to check out the sources. You can do that with CVS or with Mercurial or Git. Um, the, the, the main repository is CVS. There's an automatic conversion to Mercurial and Git that uh, is ongoing. It's off by you know, a couple hours, updates every couple hours. And then run build.sh, and that's it. And you don't need to be running NetBSD to do this. You can do it on your you know, MacBook running macOS. You can probably do it on OpenBSD. You can do it on Linux under... Any reasonably POSIX-ish system, uh, the requirements are fairly minimal. What will happen is that build.sh will first build a cross-compiler toolchain and then use that cross-compiler toolchain to build NetBSD. Uh, in NetBSD, unless you go out of your way to do it differently, every build is a cross-build. And this is very nice for keeping uh, the build isolated from the host environment. So uh, you don't have to worry about you know, struct definitions being mismatched between the host and the, and the, the resulting NetBSD. It's, everything starts with a cross-compiler and a clean environment, very uh, 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 well-controlled uh, build, build system uh, here. So uh, this, is, this is how you get started. Um, and this is how I got started, too. Uh, this is, uh, the, it's, been, it's been like this for about, about 20 years that you can, that you can uh, uh, get started this way. Um, and that's, that's a good part of what attracted me to using NetBSD in the first place. Um, so I had previously lived in the, in the Apple world running you know, Mac OS and, uh, well, as it was called then Mac OS X, uh, written with an X, but pronounced 10. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a Unix system. It's based, you know, based on some um, uh, bizarre hybrid of uh, BSD and Mach. Um, with you know, FreeBSD kernels, some FreeBSD, some NetBSD user land components, and, uh, and then a bunch of Apple stuff on top. And you know, that was, that was a, um, uh, you know, they, they, Apple puts a lot of effort into making the system uh, nice and, and, and uh, cute to use. Um, do a lot of work on polishing all the rough edges off. Uh, and you can also get reasonable development environment in, in Mac OS. But it is still very much controlled by Apple, and they get to decide what you get to do with your computer. Um, sometime around the, then, maybe 2007, 2008, uh, Apple decided uh, you shouldn't be allowed to run iTunes under a debugger. And I thought, this is, this is my own computer. It's, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the one who is, is, should be in, in charge of, of what software gets to run on this computer, uh, not Apple. And, and I, 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 was, I was offended by this denial of autonomy of my own computer. You know, it's, it's a general purpose computer. It's a, it's, it could, you know, it's a Turing machine. It can, it can do whatever computation you want. You know, in principle, I could, you know, and, and I'm sure someone has figured out some workaround that will let you actually run GDB under iTunes. Um, yeah, run iTunes under GDB, rather. That's, that would be an interesting concept, running GDB under iTunes. I don't know what that would mean. But anyway, I don't think they forbid that. But they did for, forbid running uh, iTunes under, under GDB. Uh, and and it, was, it was the, the autonomy of, of using my own computer to do the computation I want, uh, that, that, was, that was really off-putting. And you know, I, I knew that Apple controlled the, you know, the operating system. They controlled what software updates and stuff happened. But you know, I, I, could, I could still generally use the system. But it, this, this, you, know, you can't use a debugger uh, for the things that are not blessed. That, that, was, that, that really ticked me off. Um, 
Uh, and so I started chopping around for something better, uh, something that would, that, would, that would respect my autonomy. Um, and uh, that would also run on my PowerBook G4 because that's the laptop I had handy at the time. And you know, as a student, didn't have a lot of money, didn't didn't want to have to, didn't have the cash to shell out for a you know nice new laptop or, or anything like that. So uh, um, this was uh, after Apple had uh, ditched the whole PowerPC landscape, um, uh, and so I had to find something to run on PowerBook G4. And I, I shopped around a little bit. I'd run OpenBSD previously on a. Um, some uh, Intel uh, tower that I used as a home router for a few years. Um, I didn't do very much with it, just, uh, just ran it as a, as a home router then. Um, and uh, so I, I looked around at some Linux systems, uh, some you know, so BSDs uh, and a NetBSD. And um, now I had the spare PowerBook G4 and I also had a, uh, an uh, Intel MacBook, um, a 32-bit Intel MacBook, in fact. Uh, this is one of the, like the, the, the one generation of Apple hardware that was a 32-bit Intel system, so it was kind of inconvenient for a while. But um, uh, uh, So I, I was using that as my main laptop and I wanted to test things on G4, and so I, I wanted to make sure I could, well, I could, I could build it uh, uh, from the sources and have the control over what I'm actually running. Um, and uh, the only thing I found that, that, would, that made it really easy to do that was NetBSD, and so I, I gave it a shot. Um, and uh, this is the, the first email I wrote uh, to uh, 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 NetBSD mailing lists um, back in uh, June 5th, 2008. I guess that may be too small to see. I tried to get a small screenshot, but anyway, uh, showing my uh, um, tribulations with trying to follow the install instructions, which were complicated, but they worked smoothly uh, once I figured out which steps to take. Um, and uh, then within a couple of weeks of messing around with it, installing packages, uh, doing something with package source, I um, uh, found a bug, uh, which turned out to be a kernel bug. Um, and um, this is actually kind of exciting. I mean, you know, it's not great that the, the thing I was trying to you know, test out as a potential replacement for my computing platform has bugs, but I, I think we're all going to have to live with the fact that there will be bugs. Um, and uh, so it was exciting that uh, I found this, this bug. I reproduced it in, in S-Tunnel, this, uh, this program to make a uh, TLS tunnel between two servers um, uh, and expose it on a, a um, uh, local socket so you can, you can transparently make your IMAP client, if it doesn't support TLS, talk to an IMAP server that supports TLS, something like that. Um, and I went digging around uh, with this, uh, this, this really awful uh, API in POSIX called the C message uh, uh, API for ancillary data on a uh, socket. Um, this is both used for weird IPv6 features and for passing file descriptors on a socket from one process to another. And the API is, it's just awful. And not for any good reason. It's the, you have to assemble a buffer with the right alignment, uh, and there's these macros, C message length, C message space, and uh, that you have to use to get the, the right allocated buffer and a frame within the buffer to, to assemble it all yourself. And, and, and if you get the alignment even subtly wrong, then it won't work on some architectures like PowerPC, except actually it was the kernel's, pro pro the kernel's bug that it didn't work on PowerPC because, uh, well, PowerPC is, has strict alignment and x86 does not, and uh, I guess nobody tested this particular path on, on, uh, on PowerPC. So I, um, I decided, you know, uh, I, I, this seems to be a reproducible bug in uh, the system call. It seems to be doing the wrong thing based on the documentation I could find of how uh, CMessage stuff works. And so I decided, okay, I'll just open up the kernel source code and read it. It's just a bunch of C code, right? I mean, we have the, you know, a lot of people have this impression that that kernel hacking is, is this dark, mysterious, black magic. And it's really just a bunch of C code that it has some constraints. You know, you can't just forget to free memory because you need the system to continue operating. You can't just kill the process and start over because the kernel is the thing that is responsible for freeing the memory that the process failed to free. Um, and uh, so there's some constraints in kernel, kernel program, but it's, it's, it's just C code and C is, it's a fairly simple, straightforward language. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's dark corners of C, but it's, it's nowhere near you know, the, the level of complexity in, of, in the language of like C++ or Rust or, uh, or what have you. And so I, I, I just decided to I'll poke around and I, I tried to guess how syscalls were implemented. I, uh, I think what I did was I just grepped for some long syscall names um, and I found there's a bunch of functions called sys underscore and then a syscall name. And huh, these seem to be 
system call functions that I mean, it seem, seems to match up with what the system calls are called. And so I look to them, and they have these arguments that match the arguments in, laid out in a structure, but they match the arguments that are in the man pages. And, and I just kept reading, and I found, OK, well, this, this seems to be the, the send to function, the send to system call. And uh, I dug around and, and uh, found, uh, found where um, the C message header framing is parsed. And I found that there was some alignment criterion that had a, a, maybe it was an equal sign where there should have been a less than sign or a greater than sign or something like that. And I thought, huh, that's interesting. Uh, it looks like if I trace down the values that go in here then uh, the, with, on the PowerPC, then it will take the error branch. And if uh, it's on x86, then it won't take the error branch. So I don't remember the details. This is 15 years ago now, but, but uh, something like that. So I proposed a fix on the uh, NetBSD users mailing list, just a one line thing to change the, um, that criterion. Uh, and within a few days, uh, Christos, Christos Zulas, uh, committed it. And uh, that was exciting. Wow, I had just found a bug in the kernel and, and found a fix. The, the fix I suggested wasn't quite enough. Christos made it some other changes as well. Um, and it, it later turned out that, uh, in fact, it wasn't quite fixed until several years later. The, the, this C message API is really bad, and file descriptor passing is also difficult. But anyway, I was excited because I had found a bug in the kernel. I'd never done any kernel programming before. And I proposed a fix, and the fix was actually a, a reasonably good approximation to the correct fix, and someone committed it. And, and I could actually do something. Um, you know, I, I'd never done this with, with Mac, OS, Mac OS. I had no, had no chance in, in, of ever doing that until, well, I, and, you know, maybe Apple would, would hire me now, but I wouldn't want to work for them anyway. So, um, um, so then I thought, OK, well, I can, I can do kernel hacking. Uh, it was great. Uh, so I, I bit off a little more than I could chew, and um, uh, decided to try getting uh, the uh, uh, old Broadcom Wi-Fi driver working for the PowerBook G4's Airport Extreme. Um, and I spent a couple of months working on that, uh, uh, and uh, I, I had no clue what I was doing. Um, I just copied the code from uh, OpenBSD, looked at the, free, the Dragonfly code as well uh, for reference, and uh, went through. And I have no clue about Wi-Fi. I still don't really have any clue about Wi-Fi. But I just you know, tried to make it compile, see what happened. And I brought it to compile, and then I went through and tried to make it link, and got it to link, and I went through and tried to make it run. And, and you know, I just, it, just, just whenever things didn't work, I just, just tried to you know, poke around at it some more, see, see what Dragonfly is doing, see what OpenBSD is doing, see, look at the man pages, and you know, I just, just worked at it. And uh, I managed to get it working by September. Um, and I'd never done kernel hacking before. Uh, I just dove into it. Um, and uh, it, was, it was easy because I didn't, and I didn't have to worry too much about, um, uh, uh, about my, my development and machine crashing because, like I said, I had two laptops at the time. And I could just work on my MacBook, oh, thank you, uh, work on my MacBook and cross compile. And then, uh, oh yeah, conveniently, this, uh, these uh, Apple, Apple laptops had target disk mode where you could just boot uh, into target disk mode. It would expose a Firewire disk. You could just connect the two machines by Firewire, <coughs> copy your kernel over, and then uh, iterate. And so it was uh, real fast. That's not really a thing anymore, but there's other options like net booting with NFS. Uh, and uh, there's other ways to, to iterate kernel development, which I'll get into later. Um, and um, so yeah, it you know, took a bunch of work, but I, uh, I got it working. Of course, like I said, I didn't, I'm not a really good at Wi-Fi. I don't know, understand how it works. This driver is not in, in, is, isn't that great. And uh, also, Broadcom hardware is a pain. And the documentation is actively hostile. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and there's new, newer Broadcom cards, too, which with a different driver, BWFM. But, um, but anyway, so uh, let's get back to how you can hack that BSD, too. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, you can uh, check out the sources with um, CVS or Git or Mercurial. Um, at some point uh, in the near future, we are going to switch away from CVS, um, but that hasn't happened yet. So for now, uh, you can still use any of these three options. Um, and yeah, I, I know CVS is ancient and crusty, but, um, but it, it, it works, and switching is a pain, so we're, we're working on it. Uh, and then you run build.sh. Now let's go through this. This command line is a little bit long. Um, there's uh, some options here that are not the default. I picked the minimal set of options that I use personally because it's convenient for my development. Um, once you checked out the source in a directory called source, uh, and you enter that directory, um, build.sh dash uh, o dot dot slash obj says put all of the build products right there. So 
Uh, nothing will be written into your source tree. Nothing will be written outside dot dot slash object. Go all goes into the one directory. If you make a mistake and you screw something up and you're not sure if you can recover from that state, it's very easy. You just delete that directory and start over. Um, there are other ways to use build sh object trees. You can have object, object directories inside the source tree scattered throughout. You can have it in slash user slash object as traditional, but it's th what I do is this, and this is, this is handy. Um, uh, dash big U makes it an unprivileged build, uh, which really we should make the default because these days privileged builds are kind of silly, but traditionally, uh, from the 80s, um, possibly even earlier, uh, you would uh, uh, build uh, as, as root, uh, run your whole compiler toolchain as root in slash user slash source and build products in slash user slash obj. But these days, um, it is build unprivileged and you don't have to worry about root uh, running, you know, GCC or Clang or something. Uh, it's just a little bit sketchy from how heavyweight and complicated those, those programs are using, uh, yeah, anyway. Um, dash little u makes it an update build. So if something, if you make a mistake in some code you're editing, uh, it'll pick up where it left off. Uh, it takes some time for it to scan through all the directories, but um, it'll pick up where it left off once, uh, uh, once, it gets, once it gets there. So you don't have to recompile everything if you just change one .c file. We can even speed it up more by doing builds in one subdirectory at a time. I'll get to that later. Uh, dash m alpha, this says build for the uh, uh, sleek modern deck alpha architecture. Um, now you can uh, you can you can build any architecture you want. You can you can build uh, you can cross build NetBSD for the VAX if you want, or for the uh, I mean, not every architecture on the planet is supported. Uh, we haven't yet finished the PDP10 port, um, uh, but uh, you can use build sh list arch to uh, see what the options are. There's there's a lot of options, especially for um, ARM and MIPS, there's a bunch of different ABIs and variants, and it's, it's a kind of a mess for those, but um, dash big N1 makes the changes the verbosity level to one, so that it'll just say, you know, compile foo.c, and it won't uh, show the whole command line. But you can use dash N2 for whole command lines, or dash N3 for more, or dash N0 for very quiet builds. Um, I find that dash N1 is a good, um, uh, good level of verbosity, but, you know, tastes differ. Uh, you want to do parallel builds because everyone has multiple CPUs these days. If you don't have multiple CPUs, then you're going to be waiting a while. Um, uh, and then there's a target. You, you can specify several uh, build targets. Um, release builds a whole NetBSD release, the whole thing, uh, for one architecture. And it will produce, uh, it will produce uh, various things. Uh, it will produce a cross-compiler tool chain. Um, in uh, object slash, slash tooler, it'll produce uh, distribution sets based on TGZ, etc.tgz, comp.tgz, etc. Um, it'll produce a destider, which is a staged installation of NetBSD into a uh, directory. That's that's what the distribution sets are built from. Um, it will produce uh, a bunch of build uh, uh, build trees for individual programs and libraries like find. Um, uh, and uh, that's so all the .o files and the executable from find are stored in that one directory. Uh, if you need, if you screw something up with that and you need to start over, you can just blow that one directory away. Um, and it'll produce uh, kernels um, uh, in uh, obsys arch. Um, and you can find a netbsd a file called netbsd or netbsd.gdb in that directory, and that's a new kernel. You can just boot that kernel, move it to um, uh, slash, maybe move the old one to slash o netbsd so that uh, you can uh, recover if you made a mistake, but um, move it to slash and then you can boot it. Um, some other useful targets from build.sh. Um, help is always useful if you forget how to do anything. Uh, list arch, uh, if you want to build just the cross compiler tool chain, which is handy for some things, you just want a, you know, um, an ARM compiler uh, that you can run. I mean, you can use like godbolt.org if you're just playing around with, uh, with uh, seeing how compilers, uh, what I've produced, but it's handy to have a whole tool chain sometimes. Uh, distribution produces just the user land, uh, doesn't build any kernels. Um, it can be handy if you just want to you know, update your user land uh, with, um, with some changes to some files. Sets builds just distribution sets, modules, kernel modules, um, pretty straightforward. For kernels, if you just want to do kernel development, um, then build it as h tools to get a tool chain, and then build it as h kernel equals generic. Um, and that works for most ports, um, like x86 and, uh, you know, um, alpha and uh, fax and, uh, and a bunch of others. Um, for some of them, uh, uh, like 64-bit ARM and 64-bit RISC-V, the kernel is called generic64 um, for 
uh, administrative reasons that make it convenient. Um, and in some ports like FBPPC, that, that's short for Evaluation Board PowerPC, uh, these are these are ports that are designed that were originally created for um, uh, uh, just a generic hodgepodge of evaluation boards that were made by various different makers. Uh, um, there's a lot of them, you know, 20, 10, 20 years ago. Um, that uh, you know, all kind of small embedded systems, so you don't want to have a whole kernel for all possible ports. Uh, and the kernel is somewhat smaller, and it's tailored to that one evaluation board. Um, uh, for you know, embedded development kit. So you might find some of those if you're dealing with F, you know, evaluate FBPPC or FBARM or um, what have you. If you want to make a custom kernel config, um, you can either uh, just put a, uh, some customizations in generic.local. Um, this is a file that the uh, generic kernel config will automatically look at if it's there. If it's not there, no problem. But if it is there, you can just have a that file in your source tree, and it will it will never have merge conflicts when you update uh, from CVS or Git or Mercurial. Um, or you can just create a new kernel config. Um, you know, call it say debug. This is this is this is what I have in my uh, uh, debug kernel. Uh, I have a few more options than that, but they wouldn't all fit on the slides. Um, and you know, it's just to turn on some debug options so that I get some diagnostics if I uh, uh, you know, while while I'm trying to do some driver debugging or something. Um, now, if you want to boot a kernel, let's say you built one for ARCH64. Um, so uh, you, uh, you can uh, take the uh, ARM64 image that build.sh release just produced and um, uh, g-unzip it and into a disk.image file. Um, and you can uh, make a, uh, let's say, it's, it, it, this image is about one gigabyte or so, maybe a, little, maybe a few hundred megabytes. Um, once you uh, once you once you uh, extract it, um, you can expand it with DD to be. Um, uh, let's have a pointer. Oh, cool. Expand it with DD to be a uh, a sparse image by adding a single byte after 10 gigabytes. Um, and there's there's other ways to do that, but this you know, this works. Uh, and then you can even make a symlink to the kernel um, that you just built. Um, in the in the in the ca in the case for uh, booting QMU with a um, uh, NetBSD kernel, you want the netbsd.image file. And this is very handy because you can then pass it on the command line to QMU. And anytime you want to update the kernel, just exit QMU, uh, control AX, and uh, start it up again. And it will instantly boot the new kernel. Uh, you don't have to worry about copying it over, like I mentioned with target disk mode even. You don't have to copy it over to the, to the file system. Um, I mean, you can do that, but you can also boot with uh, kernel on the command line. And um, so this, uh, this just specifies uh, boot from the uh, disk DK1, which um, will be discovered from uh, the file disk.image. Uh, this makes sure that we have uh, the machine type vert as just a generic virtualized ARM system with a reasonably modern CPU instruction set, uh, not some ancient you know, ARM v5 thing or something. Um, and uh, pretends to have two cores, a gig of memory. Uh, you want to have the uh, disk to boot from. You'll also want to have a Vertio RNG device. Um, this is handy for uh, entropy, uh, especially if you want to do anything serious inside the VM, uh, like generating keys that you care about. Uh, and you'll want to have a NIC. And there's lots of options for this. Uh, but if you want to have network access to you know, talk to the host or something, then uh, yeah. So this is a complete command line for you can do some reasonable NetPC development with. Um, there's lots of other options. The QMU man page is huge. You can you know, run through it, whatever. But this is. I just create a script called run.sh and uh, put that in a directory with the disk image. And then whenever I want to start it up, I just run.sh. Um, there's some, some more options that I put in here, but you, know, you can play around with this stuff. Um, you can also uh, use uh, VND. Uh, the, um, what does it stand for? Virtual node disk? I, I, what does it stand for? Anyone remember? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's the, the virtual mm disk, um, and uh, so this is just a a, a, a virtual disk that uh, uh, exposes a file system as sorry it exposes a regular file in your regular file system uh, as a block device. You can mount file systems from that, and so you can mount the root file system and update your kernel or update the user land or whatever. Um, 
Be nice if you could also pass the kernel on the command line for x86. Right now, we don't support that. Uh, if somebody would like to volunteer to do that, uh, that would be a, a, a uh, very welcome starter project. Um, <coughs> You can also uh, run GDB on a live kernel under QMU, uh, and it's real easy. You just pass the dash S argument to QMU. Uh, this is um, actually short for a longer argument. There's more, more options for that, but dash S is the default thing. Uh, and then in your kernel build tree, where you have netbeast.gdb, um, that was uh, back up um, uh, in, in, in this directory here, um, objects, arch, the machine, compile, and the kernel configuration name. Um, so you'll find the netbsd.gdb in there. Yes, what's up? Don't you need what? Um, yes, I guess I should have mentioned that. Uh, yeah, so um, if you are doing it, right. Yeah, so, so um, right, I, uh, if you're using an, an uh, a, 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 if you're doing a cross build in the sense that you're like, not just in the way that netbsd is always a cross build, but if you're, if the host is an x86 laptop, like you might think that here, and you are trying to run GDB on an ARC64, ARM64 uh, guest, then um, you'll need to pass uh, an extra argument. Um, can I make this? Uh, um, so I hope this is. Uh, big enough for the uh, uh, audi uh, video audience to see or people in the back to see. Um, so uh, yeah, so you can use uh, build.sh-v um, make cross GDB. This will, in addition to the cross toolchain, uh, build a uh, cross GDB so that you can uh, then use um, your toolder um, and uh, 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 and you we will have a, a GDB executable that you can use for uh, the for the purpose of that um, for the purpose of uh, uh, debugging a of, of running a live kernel under GDB in um, uh, QMU. And it's uh, uh, so yeah. Uh, once once you have either if you have the the host GDB for if it's x86 to x86 or ARM to ARM or whatever, or if you have a cross GDB from build.sh, um, then you can uh, um, uh, use that to debug the live kernel um, under QMU. And it's you can like you know um, uh, uh, you can examine data structures. You can uh, you know look at what's what's going on in kernel memory. Um, I'm not sure if you can set breakpoints. Uh, you may be able to, but I don't know, it's a, it's a, you can mess around with it. Um, you can even, uh, um, oh yeah, so and uh, QMU-S is short for dash GDB TCP 1234. That's not right, there should be two colons there. Sorry, um, that, that should be two colons, not one. Um, but um, there's other options you can use for connecting QMU to uh, GDB. In fact, you don't even need to use QMU. You can run GDB on a live kernel that you're, uh, Running right now, I could do this on, on my laptop uh, right now if the system is not running at, at elevated secure level. Um, so uh, you can you can just with the, if you have the netbsd to GDB files that you use to boot the machine, um, then you can run GDB on it and you can look at you know watch your, look at the data structures changing in front of your eyes at, with with the GDB prompt. This question. Um, you, you're talking about the NetBSD user mode port, or are you talking about rump kernels? Or sorry, the question was about running NetBSD in, in uh, GDB, NetBSD in user mode under GDB. Or I'm, yeah. um, so, so are, are you are you talking about uh, like a rump kernels? Yeah, so um, the, the, uh, I'll get to this later. The, there, is, there are ways to run kernel code in user processes and run those under GDB so you're not, I mean, you know, running GDB on the live kernel, it can be dangerous if you, like, write to some memory, then you can really screw stuff up. Um, you need privileges, of course, to do this. Uh, but there's also ways to run kernel components in user land processes and run those under GDB without having to interfere with your live kernel. Um, this is mostly useful for um, like diagnosing if the system is hanging 
and you don't even know why it's hanging, but you want to do some retrospective diagnostics as part of it is hung or something. I don't do this very often, but it's kind of neat that you can do it. But I do use NetBSD under, under GD, uh, in user land processes very often, uh, and I'll get to that later in the talk. Um, Um, now, if you get a kernel crash dump, if your kernel crashes uh, and it saves a core uh, to a dump device, um, you can also use GDB to get uh, uh, to inspect the memory in the core dump. Um, there's also another command called crash. Uh, crash knows a little more about NetBSD specific things. Uh, it can sometimes handle stack traces that GDB doesn't understand. Obviously, we'd like to make GDB work better for all of those stack traces, but Crash sometimes is, you know, it's, it's easier to do that. Crash is just a, a version of the uh, NetBSD kernel debugger that runs in user land, so you can enter it without pausing everything. Um, you can also just hit the control alt escape uh, or, um, oh, I should have mentioned uh, CN magic. Um, uh, so you can also, um, oops. You can also set a syscall knob, uh, hw.cn magic. And when an, uh, on a serial console, if, if like break on a serial console doesn't work, whenever you type plus, 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 as I set it to here, or you can set it to anything, set it to hello world, then the, um, uh, the kernel will trap into a debugger and you can interactively use the DDB, the kernel debugger. Um, but uh, if you have a crash dump, uh, and oh yeah, and when, well, from the kernel debugger, you can always just continue, hit C, and then pr the machine will proceed uh, as before. But if you have a crash dump, uh, you can uh, use, whoops, uh, you can use crash to uh, get at the uh, uh, some information, like a, get at a stack trace, uh, look at the list of processes that we're running. Uh, there's a bunch of commands. You can see the uh, DDB man page for various commands um, uh, uh, for inspecting it. Um, so uh, when you're you know doing driver development and something goes horribly awry, then uh, you just, you, these are these are tools that you'll use all the time. Um, sometimes you just want to see the the D message, the the message that messages the kernel has printed. Um, including like a, if it crashed, the stack trace. Um, and uh, dmessage can do that from a uh, core dump. Now, uh, sometimes we find that on some machines, for some reason, core dumps don't work. And it's really frustrating when that happens after a weird problem we don't know about has occurred, and now the core dump is useless, or there's no core dump. Uh, so uh, you can use these syscall knobs, uh, the crash me uh, uh, tool, to um, force a panic, uh, to pretend that something had gone wrong, and see if a crash dump works. Uh, and so this, there's a few different ways to, uh, uh, to force uh, some kind of crash. You can just call the panic function, um, or you can, uh, uh, by similar to panic, by calling the panic function, uh, enter DDB directly. Um, you can like recursively lock a mutex, which is forbidden, and that's, there's some logic to detect that. Um, you can uh, enter an infinite loop with uh, interrupts blocked, and we have some infrastructure in place now for each CPU to occasionally look to make sure some other CPU is making progress. Um, and if you enter an infinite loop with interrupts blocked, that doesn't work, so the, the system will panic and say, hey, this one CPU is stuck, doesn't even do anything. And, um, or you can you know, like do something like launch Golang, a well-known test suite for the NetBSD kernel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, Go actually works pretty well in NetBSD. It's just uh, they, they they found a lot of bugs, uh, which were v by doing very weird things that nobody ever thought of even trying before. And turns out, oh, this, that path has a weird bug in it. Um, <clears throat> um, one thing that you'll want to do on let's say a new architecture uh, as you're bringing it up, or if you're you know if you're just generally making changes, or you know, it's a new machine or something, you want to run some automatic tests. So you just uh, go to CD user tests and do ATF run and pipe it to ATF report. And that will produce a uh, uh, big old report of uh, several thousand um, uh, automatic tests. It, depending on the machine, it can take you know, uh, uh, hours to many hours. Um, it's, uh, but you can also, um, uh, um, uh, you can, oh, sorry, uh, yes. So, uh, uh, usually it's run privileged on like an, in a VM or something, and this will mess with the system configuration to test lots of paths in the kernel as well as user land. Um, you can also run it unprivileged, um, and that will just skip some of the tests that are, that are dangerous, that would require privileges. Um, and I also often take the output and tee it to a file so that it, um, I can you know, scroll through it later. The atf run.out file is very verbose. 
but it has nice things like automatic stack traces of uh, test programs that crashed. Um, and the ATF report.out file has just a summary of all the test results. And it, you know, like a one-liner of each uh, you know, failure that says, you know, test program crashed with sig seg v, or test program failed with a one-liner message. And you go back to ATF run.out, and you can look, uh, look at the details. There's also nice like HTML output that um, uh, you, can, you can find at, um, uh, excuse me, let me capitalize that correctly. Um, you can find some nice uh, HTML output. Uh, it, with HTF, you can build it yourself, but we also do automatic runs. Uh, and if you just look at relinginnovacy.org and look at the automatic test suite runs, you'll find some examples of the ATF uh, test suite output. Um, see what it looks like. Um, now, if you're doing development on NetBSD, this doesn't work in, in, in cross-compilation, but like w when I'm doing development on my ThinkPad, I'm running NetBSD here. Uh, this, whole, this whole presentation is all done with NetBSD, and uh, this is my development machine. I, this is where I do all my work, all my build, most of my builds, uh, and, and a lot of my testing. Um, uh, I uh, run a, a current kernel um, uh, that, I, 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 that I build and update from time to time. And uh, I have a destitor. I, I use build.sh release to build a NetBSD user land or distribution to build user land. And then once I have that, it's a staged installation. The permissions are all unprivileged. Um, so they're all owned by you know, my regular user. But uh, in spite of that, you can still just chroot into the um, destitor and uh, then make some device nodes and mount a couple of, you know, mount PD, uh, PTYFS and tempfs. And then you can run ATF tests in the root. And so I, I have a NetBSD 9 user land running on this laptop, uh, but a, a current-ish kernel. And uh, whenever I'm doing development for, say, um, uh, pull-ups to release branches to test you know, security patches uh, or you know, uh, feature backports uh, to NetBSD 8, 9, 10. Uh, 10 is also imminent, by the way. Um, release cannot should be coming any, 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 any day now, this month. Uh, this is actually imminent, not like, not like, you know, real soon now, but, you know, actually imminent. Um, uh, and so I've, I've been doing a lot of work with, we, uh, you know, we, we, we updated OpenSSL to OpenSSL 3. Uh, man, that was a big pain. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if anyone has ever worked with OpenSSL uh, or worked with OpenSSL major version changes, but, oh, man, it is a big pain. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I, I, I expect that the number of differences between them will make that also a big pain. Um, and uh, it's, it's just, it, the whole thing is a big pain. It's, no matter what you do, it's going to be a pain. Um, you know, it, it, it's just a difference, a difference of what flavor of pain you like, I think. <laughs> um, and so we, we did a lot of work in uh, uh, testing a you know, large number of patches uh, in these true environments for NetBSD 8, 9, and 10. And I just did it all on, on this one laptop. Didn't even have to use a VM to, um, to test it. Just true it in and go, go ahead. Um. <laughs> Useless. <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, sorry. For, for the video audience, uh, there was a question whether LibreSSL cross builds to Vax, and the the answer was uh, no. Vax support was dropped, and it doesn't cross build. So, uh, evidently, this is this is a useless project. <laughs> can't run. Can't cross build to Vax. You know, <laughs> why even bother? <laughs> No, uh, uh, right now, um, OpenSSL on NetBSD, it does cross-build to VAX, um, and it, it mostly works even. Um, although I discovered recently that the uh, ed448 uh, logic in OpenSSL appears to be miscompiled by GCC or something, or there's some kind of bug in it, and so it fails tests. Um, but otherwise, it seems to work pretty well. And ed448 is pretty obscure. There's, there's really no reason to use it these days. Um, um, now, let's suppose you want to uh, uh, develop, you know, make changes to one library at a time. Uh, then you can just cd into the source directory, and there's this, this make wrapper. Um, it's a, 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 in the tooldir, uh, a, the, the executable mdmake hyphen, then machine arch, like mdmake md64 or mdmake, uh, MD um, you know, vax or whatever. Uh, this is a special, it's just a script that sets a bunch of vi make variables so that it points to the right object directory, it points to the right tool chain, it points to the right everything for just building uh, one component of a NetBSD build at a time. So once you've gone, gotten build.sh tools, uh, you can start using this to build uh, one, one subdirectory at a time. Um, 
and again, you can you can iterate this, and with it will it will install in, into the true root, um, so you can you you know test it straight from the true root. Um, for libraries, uh, it also works. You just update the dynamic libraries, and bam, everything in the true is using it now. Static libraries, you have to rebuild the dependent uh, uh, things. Uh, and the make files, um, there's one make file per program, per library. They're usually pretty short. There's a, a fairly nice language for saying, you know, this is a library. It has the following source, source files. It is called this. And it, you know, maybe has some special properties, and that's it. That's it. That's all, all, the, all the make file. Very easy to read. Um, you can get some more information in the uh, uh, share mk bsd.readme. Um, uh, if you want to change an include file, uh, like, you know, um, uh, you know, user include uh, uh, standard io.h, then you ha also have to run a separate uh, includes target. Um, oh, yeah, I should mention, depend all uh, automatically generates a file of cached dependencies, so it, it notices that if you change a header file, then this program has to change um, and, uh, and also build, build the program. Um, let's see, how much time do I have? Uh, I, I'm not actually sure when I should stop here. Top of the hour? It is. Yeah, yeah, but how much time do I have? Like, should I? Okay, okay, great, great. Uh, okay, so let's, um, now that you have the tools to, you know, start hacking something, do something, let's look at what things look like in NetBSD. And like I said, this isn't going to be a very code heavy talk. I just want to give a high level overview of, um, of uh, what some major things look like. Um, so uh, device drivers. Um, this device drivers are also not uh, the, the sort of scary black magic that the uh, public perception often has of them. Um, they're just programs that deal with, uh, you know, cantankerous pieces of hardware. Uh, and sometimes the, the, the hard part is sometimes you have to do science on the hardware if you don't have the right data sheet. But but the the, the writing the device driver itself, um, the writing the code is is fairly straightforward. Now there's two kinds of device drivers or the things that you might call device drivers in. BSD, in, in NetBSD and in other BSDs. There's autoconf drivers, um, which uh, if you, um, you, know, you have a, a laptop like this ThinkPad, it's got a PCI bus. There's a bunch of devices that are attached to this PCI bus, and it's just a, a standard for um, the interfacing between hardware like an Ethernet driver or a uh, um, uh, USB controller to the CPU so the CPU can, uh, can talk to things. Um, the, um, uh, auto, conf, uh, auto configuration. This is not the GNU autoconf. Uh, we're not talking about uh, software auto configuration. We're talking about hardware auto configuration. This is where the uh, kernel will go and enumerate all of the devices it can find by looking at the PCI bus, by looking at the you know, device tree on uh, embedded systems, by looking at ACPI, um, and uh, see. Okay, so what hardware do I have? Well, I've got a USB host controller. I've got an HDMI port. I've got an Ethernet thing, and. Uh, some of these will be exposed to software in user land. Some of them will just provide um, uh, hardware interfaces, will just provide you know, some kernel interfaces, like a, you know, a power button. Um, uh, the uh, kernel might wire up an interrupt handler for a power button so that it uh, will execute the shutdown routine. And there's no user land interface to that. But if there is a user land interface, if there is um, like a, 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 USB, a USB device like this, this uh, FIDO key, um, uh, then uh, it might be exposed uh, to uh, a dev node, a slash dev node in the file system. And that's just an interface between kernel and the user land. It might not even be backed by, um, uh, by physical hardware. There are you know, virtual slash dev nodes. Um, but uh, th these are the two things that are often meant by device driver. Um, and, uh, and sometimes they correspond. Sometimes you know, the, the, this, this device will expose a UHID uh, node in slash dev, and there is a corresponding autoconf device for that. But sometimes they don't co correspond. Sometimes autoconf devices have no slash dev nodes. Sometimes there are slash dev nodes that have no uh, autoconf devices, um, like slash dev slash tap, virtual ethernet interface. There's no hardware behind that. It's just a software abstraction. Um, so an autoconf driver um, is uh, something that will uh, uh, be detected by device enumeration on a PCI bus or device tree, and it comes in uh, uh, a few parts. Uh, there's a um, you have uh, soft C is the traditional name for uh, the state that is used by a device driver. I have no idea what it stands for. Uh, I, maybe someone at this conference knows, but software copy of the device registers. One suggestion is software copy of 
All right, software copy of device registers. Uh, do you need to find a new chair? It's <laughs> not Okay. Um, and so, there's, you know, any software state you need to interact with a device, uh, there might be, you know, you might have a reference to the device T for software purposes. Um, a lot of drivers do this. Often it's just for printing a message that is, that has, with the uh, device printf function, if you want to, you know, just give messages to the co console about the device. Um, uh, you might have, you know, a mutex for software state. You might have a bunch of other stuff. Anything that you need for interacting with the device uh, goes in, into the soft C. And then you write this bit of annoying magic called the CF attached declaration. And well, it started as CF attached decal, and then someone added a new parameter, so it became CF attached decal two, and then someone added another one, so CF attached de de decal two new, and now there's CF attached decal three, decal three new, and at some point we'll switch to C99 de designated initializers for this, but uh, we haven't done that yet. So it's uh, you just write the name of the device, the name of the autoconf device. You'll you'll see things like foo dev two, zero, foo dev one, foo dev two in D message when uh, when you boot the machine, and you tell it how much space it needs for uh, its private state, and you give it three functions uh, for um, uh, device uh, device enumeration, and. Uh, so the match function uh, will take um, uh, uh, some arguments describing the potential uh, uh, device that this driver might have found. Uh, and it um, passes through some bus arguments, uh, some information about the PCI bus, for instance, uh, if, it's, if it's attached to PCI. And this, this match function um, will uh, answer the question, can this driver handle the device? Um, so does it have the right PCI, you know, vendor and product IDs? It, does it have the right um, uh, uh, device tree compatible um, uh, uh, string? Um, and then there's an attach function uh, that once match, oh yeah, and, and the match function returns a priority number uh, in case you have like a, you know, a, a driver for generic USB devices to expose to user land versus a driver for specifically serial consoles. Uh, and you know, in principle, they could both attach, um, but the serial console one should have higher priority because it's specifically for serial consoles, not for uh, you know, general devices. Um, and uh, oh yes, yeah, so, uh, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll get to this in a moment. Um, then once the OS has decided which driver is responsible for a device, uh, you um, uh, it will call the attach function. And that uh, actually allocates resources for interacting with the device. It will allocate memory for buffers that it has to uh, do and make it, you know, create mutexes, create threads, you know, what have you. And then once the device goes away, when you take a USB device and you yank it out, um, uh, that uh, the detach function gets called. Uh, now, detach functions are a little bit tricky. Um, and I gave a talk at uh, last year BSDCon about those. Um, I don't know if this QR code is too small, but uh, if you want to take a look at the talk from last year, uh, I went into some details about how detached functions are tricky and how to uh, make them work reliably so that um, you can uh, actually just take uh, like a you know, USB uh, device and yank it and put another one in. And even if you're using it heavily at the time, uh, this machine has not crashed, I hope. <laughs> Um, yeah, I forgot to do the live demo last year. I, I just I was giving the talk and, and it just didn't occur to me to do the live demo. Um, uh, so um, now if you have a, a, a slash dev node, this is a, like a character special. Um, this is the interface between kernel and user land. So the autoconf device is the interface between hardware and kernel. Uh, character special is the interface between kernel and user land. And so you just give a, a, a collection of functions that will be called when a process opens the device node when the process closes the file description, when a process does read or write or whatever. And there's some other administrivia. If you want to create a new one, um, you have to create an, a major number um, the, and, and perhaps minor numbers um, uh, for uh, just to determine the, 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 the number, the major number is, is what actually uh, determines which uh, logic gets used when the user land talks to a, uh, the kernel. Um, Traditional slash dev nodes uh, correspond to physical hardware devices, and so um, you know if you if you want to open a device, you're actually opening access to you know a floppy drive or an ATA device or something or a, a SCSI device, um, and uh, so the, there's uh, the state is 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 just global state uh, from the, for the for the driver. There are also cloning devices where every open has its own 
personal state. And uh, you could, it's a little more flexible for some things. Um, so like the audio uh, mixer interface, uh, which automatically mixes uh, audio from multiple streams and then sends it out to a physical hardware device. That is a cloning device. Um, some others, uh, like the VHCI USB virtual host control interface, used for debugging for, and for uh, testing the USB stack. Um, and uh, with a cloning device, you just specify an open function and then a file ops uh, set. That's a set of functions that's similar to CDEV uh, um, in the previous, uh, previous slide, um, but you get, it's, you get a little more flexibility and per open state rather than per device state. Um, and uh, there's a special structure to how you have to, have to do the open function. Um, you can look at this in the slides later if you're interested. Um, quick rundown of uh, bus space. So hardware devices, um, the way that they're usually exposed is that you get a data sheet and the data sheet says, okay, here are the device registers. A register is sort of like, um, device registers sort of like a location in memory. It's like, you know, if you, the, you have uh, allocate an, ar an array of ints, uh, of uint32, that's a bunch of uh, spaces for four bytes. When you write an integer and when you read it, read the same address back, you get the same thing you wrote. Well, device registers are just like that, except that when you write something out, the CD tray ejects, or when you read something back, then the CD tray ejects. Or you know, the device registers are they're, they're, they work just kind of like for locations in memory. You can write to them, you can read from them, but they do magic hardware stuff instead of just remembering what you wrote. Um, and uh, so, um, when you have a driver, the the bus will give you a bus space tag. Um, there's different. There's a few different ways to get at device registers. Like in in legacy x86 systems, you might have heard of I/O ports. Um, this is a, it's an address space. There's, you know, uh, addresses that you can, you can get at, uh, uh, you know, uh, like Xerox 3F8 uh, is the serial console in BIOS systems. Um, and, uh, but sometimes you'll, you'll have memory mapped IO uh, that's where uh, the, the CPU actually exposes it just like a memory address. But when you do a write instruction or read instruction, load or store instruction, uh, it, you know, CD tray ejects instead of, you know, writing something to memory. Um, so you, uh, if you want to use, use uh, any device registers in NetBSD, you have to you start with the bus space tag and an address that is given to you by, uh, in a, like typically given in the aux argument to a, a match and attach functions in autoconf. Um, so PCI will, uh, you know, will, will give you a couple of bus space tags for memory, uh, memory mapped IO and IO ports um, on some machines. Uh, and you map it into a bus space handle, and a handle represents a small contiguous chunk of a, you know, a window into the space of um, device registers. And then you can just read and write uh, registers. Your food kernel will be some defined that you get from data sheets, a number, um, uh, just a number of a register relative to the start of a block. Um, and then you can write, you know, write it back, tw twiddle some bits, whatever. It's just, you know, you get a four byte uh, thing from bus space read four and write it back. There's a bunch of other bus space stuff. You can look at the man page, it's big, but the concept is, is, is generally very simple. It's just you get a, you know, windows into a uh, little address space for device registers that match what you see in the data sheet. If you have a data sheet, which is nice. Sometimes you don't have a data sheet, which is not nice. Um, so d often you'll have a uh, file full of register definitions that just says, okay, this is from the uh, uh, Rockship uh, crypto uh, engine driver. Um, so there's a bunch of registers that in the register block. Maybe it'll be like you know one page long or something. It's at 0x200 is the TRNG control register. And then we have some definitions for bits inside it. The bit macro uh, creates a bit field with just that one bit set. The bits plural macro creates a bit field with all the bits between those two numbers set. And you can, um, uh, you can like, assemble a new control by shifting the value 100 into the field of the uh, uh, cycle, into the cycles field, um, and that will put it in, in here. Well, in this case, it doesn't do anything because it's it starts at bit zero. But you can you can um, it's a handy macros for for putting uh, bits into right into uh, into uh, fields inside a, inside a, like a 32-bit word wherever you want. So you can this you just transcribe the uh, data sheet. You, you'll see a table of registers and table of fields in the register. You just write down what the bits are. And then when you want to use, uh, put, you know, make uh, something to write into a register, you use shift in. When you want to pull something out of register you read, use shift out. It's pretty handy. Um, there's another thing, bus DMA for, okay. Um, do I have time for questions after this or is my, Okay, all right. Uh, real quick then, uh, just uh, 
Um, this is how you uh, say, you know, someone wants to write a, uh, a, a, a bunch of data over the network. Um, so they put it into a memory that they pass in user land, they pass to uh, write, uh, the write system call or send to. Um, bus DMA is the API that the driver will use to make that memory available to the Ethernet driver so you don't have to mem copy it and in, in the CPU. And um, bus DMA abstracts a lot of details like getting the IOMU right, getting bounce buffers if they, there are address space restrictions and so on. Um, uh, now, someone asked, but I think he might not be here anymore, um, about, uh, almost done. Um, about uh, running uh, kernel components in user land. So you can use this thing called rump, um, which lets you run kernel code in user land processes, like the, you know, the, um, uh, run, run threads, run device drivers, uh, run file systems. Uh, we have extensive file system tests that all run inside rump. Um, and so you can uh, uh, just uh, uh, use nbmake under the source slash rump to um, build subdirectories, and it will install into the root. And you can run uh, like the VFS tests uh, in the truth uh, with um, uh, with ATF and run it under GDB. And that way, that's how I did a lot of file system debugging um, to uh, uh, fix like the rename system call, which is very difficult. Involved hammering on the file system extensively, and then in user land, and then running GDB on the result when it crashed, and seeing oh, it's, I forgot that 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 case right there. Um, and so that's it. So now you can all get, get hacking NetBSD. Uh, and if anyone has questions. <laughs>